A couple of videos ago, I described how a wing produces lift and it created quite a stir in the comments section. I didn't realize that Newton's third law was so controversial. I'm Stan, let's get into it. Lift is one of those things that most passengers can't explain yet count on for their very survival. Pilots take a knowledge test prior to being sprung loose. Unsurprisingly, they expect you to know a little bit about what an aircraft wing does before they print your certificate. So let's go ahead and open the fundamentals of flying manual. A wing has a relatively flat bottom with a convex top. The shape of the top is tapered to make it as efficient as possible, which means that it produces a maximum amount of lift for the minimum amount of drag. We'll circle back around to that in a little bit because it's important. Now pilot textbooks, which are not to be mistaken for engineering manuals, give a generalized explanation about how this produces lift. It usually goes a little something like this. The air traveling over the top of the wing must travel further than the air traveling beneath it, a curved surface being longer than a flat bottom. This higher velocity air has lower pressure than the air below the wing. And this is frequently where the discussion stops. Many students conclude that the higher air pressure below the wing is what produces lift. Now this isn't entirely incorrect, but it leaves out an important element. What does a pressure differential do to the air itself? This has important implications for aircraft flying behind other aircraft, a common occurrence during approaches to busy airports. Sometimes scientific conclusions are contested, such as the age of the shroud of Turin. But in the case of Newton's third law, there is no dispute. Any time a force is applied to an object, an equal and opposite force is applied to something else. The scientific community uniformly agrees on this. For a wing to produce lift, it must apply an equal and opposite force on something else, and the only thing that a wing has to work with is the air that flows around it. In other words, if you're using air to lift a 50,000 pound aircraft, you're going to have to displace an equivalent amount of air downwards. Now hang with me as I get nerdy for a moment here. There's a difference between an object's mass and its weight. With weight equaling mass times 1g, the approximate gravitational pull of the Earth on an object located at sea level. A jetliner at 35,000 feet actually weighs a little bit less than one sitting on the tarmac at Heathrow, even though the mass of the jet doesn't change. This is because the force of gravity is related to the distance between two objects as well as their individual masses. The Earth is a very large mass compared to an airplane, so it dominates the equation, but technically, an airplane is pulling the Earth up every bit as much as the Earth is pulling the airplane down. Now, this fulfills Newton's third law that every force results in an equal and opposite force. The point here is that every force that you experience has a doppelganger, something with the exact same magnitude but in an opposite direction. In physics, they use something called the force vector, a three-dimensional arrow that depicts the average of all forces that are at work on an object. In pilot's textbooks, you'll find arrows depicting weight, lift, drag, and thrust. You'll notice that for every aerodynamic error, there is an opposite vector. When these vectors are equal, the aircraft exists in a steady state, not accelerating in any direction. When they're not equal, the aircraft accelerates towards the smaller vector. If you're standing on the ground, you're applying a force on the ground. You can feel it in your legs. If you jump off of a building, you'll accelerate towards the ground at approximately 9.8 meters per second squared, the acceleration rate of gravity. As you fall faster and faster, you'll hit more and more air molecules, causing them to accelerate in the direction that you are traveling. As you accelerate the air, it pushes back against you. Eventually, this counterforce will cause you to stop accelerating towards the ground. This occurs somewhere between 150 and 180 miles an hour, where you'll still be falling, but you will no longer be accelerating. A wing follows all these same rules. It just does it better. To maintain altitude, you must produce lift equal to weight. Lift is a force, and like all forces, it must be canceled by another force that is equal and opposite. On one side of the equation, you have the mass of the aircraft and the acceleration of gravity. On the other, you have the mass of the air times the acceleration that the wing is generating against that air. If the lift vector is up, the air vector is down. It's important to remember that the lift a wing produces doesn't have to counter gravity. When inverted, lift can actually act in tandem with gravity to increase your acceleration rate towards the ground. And for those out there who insist that the low pressure area on top of a wing is what produces lift, how does a pilot maintain level flight when inverted? It's by creating an angle of attack negative enough to displace air downwards or upwards depending on your perspective. You'll have a smooth ride if you cross the flight path of a million pound Airbus A380 a thousand feet above. You'll even be okay if you cross at the same altitude. 
At 1,000 feet below, you'll total a $50 million airframe. Just ask the pilots of this Bombardier Challenger 604, who in 2017 lost control after encountering wake turbulence from an Airbus A380. The CL-604 lost 9,000 feet of altitude through several uncontrollable rotations. The loss of control occurred about one minute after the A380 passed overhead, headed in the opposite direction, 1,000 feet above the CL-604 over the Arabian Sea. The CL-604 was headed from the Maldive Islands to the United Arab Emirates with three crew members and six passengers. Two of those passengers were seriously injured, with three other occupants suffering minor injuries. After inspecting the aircraft, Bombardier stated that the airframe could not be restored to an airworthy state. The cause was the wingtip vortices produced by the Super Heavy A380, and that's the literal designation of the 380, Super Heavy. It's the only airliner in the world with that designation. Vortices are circular air patterns generated at the wingtips due to the differential pressures that exist above and below the wing. Importantly, they descend behind the aircraft that generates them. The Airman's Information Manual instructs pilots following large aircraft on approaches to maintain a glide path that is at or above the glide path of the preceding heavy aircraft. It also warns pilots about the possibility of wake turbulence when crossing beneath the heavy aircraft. This is because wings cause air to descend. In aviation textbooks, this is where the misunderstanding begins. When depicting the four primary forces acting on an aircraft, pilot manuals simplify them as thrust, drag, lift, and weight. Thrust causes acceleration of an aircraft until drag equals thrust, at which point the aircraft sustains its cruising speed. Lift counterbalances weight, but weight is a measurement of mass and gravity, not a force. Aviation textbook writers are doing what politicians the world over have perfected, generalizing truth to the point where it becomes a lie. They depict three forces and then imply that one of those forces is counterbalanced by a measurement. It isn't. It's counterbalanced by another force, which is a mass of air that is being flung downwards by the wing. The weight of the aircraft just determines how much air needs to be directed downwards for the aircraft to float. Now, I don't want to be too hard on these riders. There's a reason why they do what they do. Pilot certificates don't require a background in physics. There's already a ton of information for a pilot applicant to come to grips with. Still, it's important to recognize the descending chaos that a heavy leaves in its wake. There are massive forces at work behind and beneath the wing. It's not an area you want to be messing around with. You don't even need a curved upper surface to produce lift. Any flat surface presented to a slipstream at an angle of attack will do the job. Take a Delta Wing. In general, made for Mach 2 plus aircraft, they are extremely thin to reduce drag. At slower speeds, which in their case is upwards of 250 knots, they produce lift by bludgeoning the air downwards, unlike a more traditional wing, which massages it. The whole purpose of the curve on the top of the wing is to accelerate air into a descent as it reaches the trailing edge. This is more efficient than sticking a 2x4 into the slipstream because the boundary layer air retains smoothness better up to higher angles of attack. Smoother air reduces drag, which is bad for top speed and fuel economy. You may not always appreciate the engineers who fretted over the mathematics of Newton's laws, but they're the reason that you can get a plane ticket to Dubuque for 80 bucks. Low performance wings are big, curved, dopey things that stall gradually and recover without the pilot having to do much of anything. High performance wings are sharp as a razor and much less forgiving when maneuvered to the limits. The truth of the matter is that low performance wings are generally mated to aircraft designed for stability over performance. High performance aircraft sacrifice stability for efficiency and speed. By the time you get to the turboprops and jets, there is a thinner line between catastrophe and a safe landing than you might think. The training programs for turbine pilots are relentless. If you can't pass your annual check ride, you lose your job. The standards are high, but there is no such thing as an error-free flight. As an applicant and check airman, I've been involved in hundreds of check rides in my career. I've never witnessed a perfect one. Give me Chuck Yeager in a sim, and I'll have plenty on the list to debrief him when we're done. Aviation is one of those things that you gain experience in, but never master. So it is today, we add one simple and small piece to the repository of YouTube knowledge. Wings make air descend. It's not magic, it's just physics. You want to blame someone? Blame the apple that fell on Sir Isaac's head 100 years before democracy was born. And for those of you who got this wrong, don't feel too bad. Even NASA admits the heated debates that this sometimes creates. The scientific community is actually prone to making the opposite error, mistaking angle of attack and the bottom of the wing as the sole reason that lift is produced. The top of the wing is vital, which is emphasized at the aviation manuals. 
but it's not because it's magically bypassing Newton's third law. It's just doing it in a more efficient manner, which in aviation means with less drag. If you haven't already, please like and subscribe. Hit the bell for notifications when new videos come out. Keep the comments coming below. I read all of them. Until next time, keep the blue side up and the gauges in the green.